Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever it is for you. Probably evening, I think, for most people. Um, very warm welcome, anyway. Um, this is uh, part two of making personalized learning possible with the Mario framework. If you attended last week's, then the content this week is all different. Uh, there will be some overlaps, though. So uh, if you did attend last week, just bear with us uh, as we as we go through this. But this is this is pretty different. OK. Uh, so just a couple of introductions. Um, I'm going to introduce Phil in a moment. Uh, myself, my name is Graham Scott. I'm executive chair of the Mario Framework. Um, this is my 37th, 37th, maybe 38th year in education. I've sort of stopped counting. Um, it's the first of those years, though, that I've not been in a classroom, uh, which feels kind of weird, uh, but really loving my work with the Mario framework. Uh, before this, I was um, a school leader for 26 years in a number of different schools, um, both at, um, in my home country of the UK and also overseas in Europe, in the Far East, in the Middle East as well. Um, Really delighted to be working with Phil. So Phil is a very experienced learning support teacher, um, currently working in the high school at International School Bangkok. And this is 11 years Phil's been there before that in working again in a similar role in the state of Georgia, USA. Um, I actually overlapped with Phil at ISB. I worked with him for six years when I was deputy head of school there. And within months uh, noticed this incredible bond that he had with his students and, and the amazing progress they made, uh, both academically, but also socially, emotionally as well. Um, and picked up pretty quickly, there was something special going on. And then only later on did I find out what it was. And what it was, was the very beginnings of the Mario framework. So you'll hear more from Phil very soon. So good news to start with. Um, last, last week, we had a, a free giveaway of a course. Um, this week, we're, we're so grateful, first of all, to ACOS for, for hosting and organizing this webinar, um, and the, the, the second and two, but also they've been so kind as to grant a scholarship. Uh, so this is for um, someone in a, uh, an ACOS school, um, and probably somebody whose school maybe is going through some financial challenges. I know the last two years have been really, really difficult for many schools. We've seen a lot of schools that have um, uh, dropped in enrollment, so they've frozen uh, or they've reduced professional development, professional learning allowances. Um, you'll see the, the web link on the bottom there, marioframework.com forward slash scholarship. If you head to there, if you want to apply, uh, we'll be looking at all uh, applications. Don't worry about the deadline date on there. It says September. Don't worry about that at all. Uh, if you think you're, you're a good candidate, um, pop your name there, apply, and we'll certainly have a look at it. Okay, so that's some good news to start with. And then just, a, it looks like a short agenda, but all of these are fairly meaty. Um, I'll hand over to Phil very soon, uh, and he will tell you how design th the design thinking process or cycle or whatever we want to call it, um, has really influenced and, and helped build the Mario framework. And he'll tell you the story of, of Mario from the get-go. Um, we'll also share with you why we, really prioritize these one-to-one -one learning conversations and why they're so important to student development and growth. Uh, we'll handle a few uh, FAQs before going over to any questions that you might have as well. And if you do have any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat or hopefully at the end, we'll have some time to take some as well. Okay. So with no further ado, I will hand over now to Phil, uh, who will take you through the beginnings of the Mario framework. Over to you, Phil. Thank you, Graham. And one thing before we get started is something that's missing from here that you may have noticed in, in kind of the overview of what we'll be covering is real one-to-one -one sessions. They do, they, we are gonna share those with you, but we're gonna share those in a separate email. 
The reason we're not covering them right now is because we've taken those one-to-ones and we are ensuring that the real ones have voice actors and we have animations instead of the uh, real students present just to really protect their privacy um, as that's something we're really careful about. So instead of sharing that in this recorded webinar, we are gonna share in the next couple of weeks um, a session or two that are recorded, but they're gonna have voice actors and they're gonna have um, animations instead of actually seeing them. And that's just to protect privacy. So that will come your way. Um, all right, so let's get started. And you may have seen this slide if you joined last time, but I'm not gonna go over this again because I'm going to actually go over with you the really formation of the Mario framework through the lens of the design thinking process. And hopefully the idea is you'll be able to steal ideas for how to really embed design thinking in your own class. I did go over um, a, a similar session in Senia last year. However, this one's slightly different. Um, so you will see some differences there, but hopefully you can take some of these uh, ideas and incorporate them in your class design right away um, and learn a little bit more about the Mario framework as we do that. So first of all, uh, Freeham mentioned design thinking process or design cycle. And I think those are used interchangeably. I prefer design thinking um, rather than a cycle because I think you can do cycle kind of things. It makes it sound like there's one step at a time. And the way I like to think about it, sometimes we're in multiple phases at once. But yes, we do that over and over again. So it's a little bit of both. Um, where does this come from? I prefer the Stanford D School model or IDO. And really, it doesn't matter though. It doesn't matter if you use Stanford's design thinking cycle. Actually, the IBO and MYP has a fantastic cycle. Um, there's lots of them out there. Which one you use is up to you. And you can use actually combinations of several. It's fine, but it's this mode of thinking and being able to identify important pieces to help you move ideation, um, iteration forward. So, all right, going over a few of these, we're just going to do two at, a, two at a time here and then we'll move forward. Um, the first step or one of the first steps is empathizing which I think a lot of us are just really skilled at because as teachers, we have to do a lot of this. Um, and it includes observing, engaging, and watching and listening. And I wanna circle that last one, which is that listening. And one thing I advocate for, you know, really paying close attention to is how much you're talking versus how much you're listening in the classroom. And really trying to lean heavier on that listen component, which, which can be challenging at times. And the second one here is defining. And this really is defining either the problem that we're trying to solve or actually the situation itself, right? Um, so it's in essence, sense-making. And, and what do we, who do we have? What's the need? And what could be the solution or, or what are some ideas, right? And this is just kind of a, a cool little scaffold so-and-so needs to blank to blank. And if you can answer that, you've already started to do that, that um, defining phase, which I think can be really useful as you move forward. All right, so what did this look like in practice in the formation of the Mario framework to give us some context? Um, so I'm gonna tell a story uh, that, you know, it was, it was really difficult for me when it happened, but without it, I, I don't think this would have been possible. Um, I had a student, we'll call the student Max, that's not actually their name, um, but I had them in class for quite a bit of time. This was, I think it's about this time in the year. It may have been about mid-October. And I thought everything was fine throughout the, the school year. And actually they were tracking okay, right? With some dips, there were some dips in performance. And at the end of one day, they stayed behind and they just broke into tears. And, you know, I obviously asked well, what's going on, how can I help, and they were dealing with a very, very complicated issue, but they were dealing with that issue from the day they walked into the classroom. And what I realized really quickly is I had dropped the ball because I hadn't been listening enough to them. 
There was a lot of conversations with groups, but there wasn't enough one-to-one -one interaction. And I hadn't been actually scaffolding opportunities to really listen to Max. And it became one of those aha moments that how many more people like Max are there out there that have things that are very significant going on, but I just don't know what's happening. So it, it became this, how might I better connect with and understand with my students so that I can help them? And that really became something that, that kind of became the impetus for this. Um, and as you can see, it's not just Max, right? We have a number of different students. And in today's world, it's quite complicated, right? Because we have, in, in a lot of cases, the social distancing pieces, we have the masks. So we have even more barriers to figuring out what's happening. We don't have a lot of these organic conversations always happening um, between the students or students have had time away from others behind their screens. So maybe their social skills are not as far along as they used to be. So I believe this has become an even more important issue that we really do need to be addressing. Okay, so I had defined what the issue was, but it became clear that I needed to go further than that. And that's where the ideation process comes into play. Now, ideation is interesting because it means you're throwing all ideas at the, the problem or situation, but you're deferring judgment. That last part is key. And I think that's very hard. Well, it's very hard for me as an educator initially to do that because Instantly, as soon as we put up a solution, I'm instantly going, okay, what are the problems with this? I'm, I'm poking holes and pressure testing it right away. Whereas in this phase, it's throwing out as many as possible and really collecting them. Um, ideally in a document or someplace you can refer to them later when you can judge them. So in this phase, we really want to get as many as we can. And you know, even if it seems like something that's not reasonable, throw it up there because we may later think of a way to really make that work. And maybe it's outside the box. Maybe, maybe it is. Um, all right. Now, in doing this and, you know, really figuring out this ideation process, who better to talk with than your students? Right? I mean, I mean, so such a key part of, of the situation is having conversations with students. And that's what I did. So as part of this, I was having one-to-one -one students um, which I didn't know that was going to be a key part at that time, but I was having one-to-one -one conversations with these students and being like, how could we better connect? How could I better understand what's happening in your life, right? And, and I was asking them, well, as I'm doing that, I quickly realized how powerful just that interaction was. I was finding that just having these conversations is where I was learning so much about them um, they were really becoming more engaged as well, and they were becoming more a part of the learning. And I, I love this um, quote from Barbara Walker, also an educator, saying that most people want to tell their story. That's, that's what people really want to do. So giving them that opportunity is quite important, whether it's an adult or whether it's a child. So one thing to keep in mind as we're about to move forward, because I'm going to go into the, the research and evidence underpinning the Mario framework, which is extremely important. And it seems like coming up with ideas should be very similar to research. Well, kind of, kind of not really, um, because research is pretty, it's got its stuff together, right? They are evaluating things right off the go, whereas ideation, we're looking at multiple things and we're deferring that judgment. Now, I started with the easier one, which was the research and evidence in education. And I say easier, um, but I spent an entire summer doing this. And I think I'd wake up at 7 a.m. I'd go, I'd work probably for 12 hours a day. Um, and I, I really, in some ways, um, was looking at all the research that has already been done that's very much well known. At the center of that was Hattie's work and his meta-analyses, it was Marzano. Um, I also really liked what Piaget was doing, um, a little more old school, but looking at a lot of different works and then finding out what are the most effective learning strategies that we find. 
Um, and these are some of them here. These are some of the most effective strategies. Keeping in mind, point four is our hinge point, um, as Hattie refers to it, meaning that that's the average impact of an intervention. So if we're looking to really increase our efficacy, we should be focusing on things 0.4 or over. And as you notice, most of these are, are you know, around double that effect size. Um, so these are really the most effective. Um, and all of these that you see here are learning strategies that we decided to embed into the Mario framework. So this is very much at our central core of what we do. Now, simultaneous to this, I started looking at multidisciplinary research in other fields. And this is where the ideation comes into play a little bit and that experimentation. The I in Mario is innovation because yes, we should have a research core of what we know works, but actually experimenting in healthy amounts helps push us forward, right? That's what's gonna take us to that next level. So what we did is looked at different fields, um, including um, medicine was a big one, design thinking, as you see, uh, psychology and ecological system theories. And the, the issue was there wasn't one magic bullet that were like, oh, this is perfect, except for this takeaway. And in all of these areas, there was this very clear message that change is most profound when it comes from within. When it's not coming from an external force, when it's the, the person at the middle really coming up with that change and then really pushing forward with that change instead of other actors trying to make it happen. And if you think about education, that's an interesting, right? Um, and this isn't a new concept. Um, Student-centered um, student learning is not new. However, with this context, it just kind of emphasizes how important that is and how sometimes that's may not be what we're doing in certain contexts. So the idea was, how do we do this? How do we make this at the center of everything we do, really empowering students through personalized learning that matters to them? So putting them at the center and really allowing them to drive that learn learning. Another side point to this, was it was also important to me to figure out how to do this sustainably. Because when you hear about personalized learning, it can actually be quite scary because you think, well, I can't teach 20 different ways for 20 different learners, right? And, and well, you can't, but <laughs> I think we all know that. So the idea is how do we create a structure that allows for this personalized learning and allows for each student to really be focusing on what matters and still achieving those higher outcomes that we, we have for all students that we want all students to achieve. So that was kind of the, the balancing act there. Um, now, again, to really move forward, it was important to bring the students in and having them co, you know, have co-authorship um, of the ideation process, even though I had had a summer, I came back to them with what I had found. And I was just, you know, very honest with them. I was like, look, I want to make this class better. Here's some ideas I have. And I did have pretty much the start of the Mario framework then, but I involved them in that process. What do you think of this? How could we improve this? And then when they developed their personalized learning plans, which is something we talk a lot about in the Mario framework in our courses, is having them play a central role in, in developing those plans with us in tandem. All right. Now, the next um, stage phase, however you wanna call it, is prototype. And there's a lot of different things you're doing with prototype, but I think all of these points are really important and not all of them are intuitive. And I think one that stands out to me is build to fail quickly. I think a lot of times when we're trying to build something, we want to get it right from the get-go. And while, while that's, you know, I, I think speaks to, to us wanting to make a difference, in some ways we, we can be our own uh, roadblock there. Because the sooner we get it out there and the sooner we're experimenting with students, the sooner we can get feedback from the students. And we can see if we're on the right path or if we need to adjust things. 
And really, this is all about making improvements. It's all about making mistakes, <laughs> finding those, those mistakes, and then moving forward. Growth mindset seem familiar? That's, that's all over this. And I think it's also a very teachable moment as you're going through a different way of instruction with your students, being very upfront with them and showing them what you're doing, modeling this for them. Because what great opportunity for students to see my teacher is doing something where they may fail and that's okay because they're actually gonna be improving. So you're modeling uh, growth mindset for them. It's really cool. Um, and I think also one thing that, that is tough at times is really identifying the variable and questions before you get started because that allows you to create surveys or conversations with students to figure out if you're really achieving um, what you're setting out to achieving or if, if you're actually hitting on something else in mind, but always with the student in mind. So keeping all this in mind, the Mario framework really, when we started out with, this is what we started out with. Um, and there's, there's a lot of things here. <laughs> We're not gonna go very in depth into this because, well, we don't have a day. <laughs> Looks like we have about 30 minutes left. Um, but as you can see, a lot of this revolved around personalized learning. And it revolved around students playing a large role. Um, they were not just someone that this learning happened to, they were someone that was driving the learning. They were also measuring the learning. And I think that's really important that we have students involved in measuring learning. And it's also very scary because I'm, I'm proposing that when you have a lesson or you try something out, after you do that, sending a quick form on how much learning did you get from this? You can also do how much did you enjoy? I think those are two separate questions but really getting that quantifiable feedback from students, while it can be scary, it can be also quite enlightening. Um, and we did that throughout for years. We were you know, asking, you know, how effective is this? How effective is this? And really over time, figuring out those trends and seeing what is most effective and, and what's not <laughs> is super helpful in, in moving you forward. And again, this can be used in whatever context um, you have in your classroom. So a little bit about one-to-one -one sessions and, and conferences. Um, actually, yep, okay. I wanna make sure I wasn't stealing Graham's thunder because he's gonna be coming in at some point. I'm not, so I'm gonna continue. <laughs> um, there are two types of one-to-one -one learning conversations um, that we have in the Mario framework. And they really are the heart of what we do. And there's these, shorter, more frequent one-to-one -one sessions. And those happened every class for us. And they were between five to seven minutes. And there is a structure. Again, this is part of the, the course is we do teach how to implement these. But by having this flexible structure, it allows us to go in and to really have effective one-to-one um, -one learning sessions where at the end of each one, every single one, the student is empowered to move forward. And I think that's really key. Um, over and over again, the feedback from students um, was what was the, and actually this wouldn't just be for our class, it was in school, what was the most effective thing to help you learn this year? One-to-one -one learning conversations. So I, I think that speaks volumes to it. In addition to the shorter five to seven minute sessions, we had longer one-to-one -one conferences. It says 15 minutes, but if you're in elementary school, you are not doing a 20 minute conference. <laughs> it does look different um, at different levels, uh, but it could be anywhere from 10 minutes to 25 minutes. They are longer, they're more comprehensive. And in some ways, I don't wanna say it's summative because it is both in, um, informal and summative or formative and summative, but we're looking at the performance in lots of key areas, especially in, in and we're gonna talk about these in a moment, self-awareness, self-advocacy, self-management skills, um, and self-directed learning and in goal progress. We're really looking at all these key areas. Um, all right, so the final, again, 
if we're thinking about a cycle, this would be the final stage, but you could be doing this throughout, is testing. Um, and, and I think, you know, we talked about this a little bit already, but it's ask, asking users to compare. Um, and when you're constantly asking them how much learning they're getting from this versus how much learning they're getting from this, you're going to get quantifiable data. But what you could also do is which is more effective? Which do you learn more from? And you can draw direct comparisons, or you could have several things that you're comparing against. And that's going to be super useful for you to figure out what works best, what's not working at all, and what could we tweak. Um, also, it's that showing piece. As, as I mentioned before, it's not just enough um, to, to tell, to, you actually need to be showing students what you're going to be doing and then implementing it, right? Um, but laying it out from, for them in the beginning, right? Um, don't just tell them that you're doing something new. Show them what that's going to look like right from the beginning. Don't just say, hey, further on in the course, we're going to do some things around this. Show them what that's going to look like right from the get-go. Um, and create experiences um, where it's immersive. That's easy for us because we're in the classroom. Almost all the time, we're creating experiences. So that's kind of an easy win for us. Um, Something important that I learned early on that I want to share with you so that if you're looking to really start your own action research project that you keep in mind. And one of them is the importance of diagnostic data. So before you're starting any new um, project, really getting a handle on where they are now in current areas um, of performance. And that goes back to us talking about identifying the variable and the questions, right? Because if we know that, we can create better diagnostic tests. Um, and, and I do, I do um, recommend you do this every single year at the beginning of the semester. And you also do it at the end of the semester as you evaluate the efficacy. You're really getting that baseline data for where they're starting. And then you can see how effective your, your action research project is. Also having control groups, this one can be challenging for us in schools. Um, one way you could do it if you want is you have one class that has this experimental approach that you're using. Um, or if you are using something like the Mario framework, having some of your teachers or some of your classes use it and then some of them not using it. But I'll be honest, that can be challenging because if we believe in something like what we've done, we've done massive amounts of research and evidence ahead of time. So if you know it's gonna work, it may be really tough um, to rationalize not giving uh, an approach that's going to work um, to students. So I would say with this one, it's really going to come down to um, what you think is best for your learners. So in a lot of cases, this may not actually happen. And the way you can look at it is just previous performance of other groups. So that's one way you can look at this. It's not perfect, but you know, it, it, it is a tough one. So I just want to kind of throw that out there, something to think about. Um, as you look at all that test data, you are going to evaluate. Um, and a really important piece about this, what I'm going to talk about in a moment, is it's not just about looking at the diagnostic data. Um, so there's actually a couple parts here. Um, and the first is the formal piece. It's actually looking at the data and seeing what students say, right? Uh, this is just one, one kind of just snapshot of something students said. Um, and it was very clear, you will find pieces that are very clear, um, but you'll also find some interesting data that is unclear and you don't know exactly how to read it because some students may say that they're getting a lot from it. Some students may say, mm, not so much. So what do you do in that case? You go back to the students and it's having conversations with the students. So what I recommend is something I think a little different than happens in some schools a lot of times we do that end of semester, or end of term feedback at the end of term. What I would recommend is doing it a bit before the end of term, doing it three weeks, four weeks before the end of term. So by then they've had enough time to really give um, solid feedback, but then you can look at that feedback and you can go back to your students and you can have some conversations that really probe those areas that you're unsure about. So I think that's an invaluable um, chance. And it's a chance where they're, they're just gonna be able to share their overall learning and some of that um, 
uh, qualitative data that, that may be just good to hear as well. One of the things that I think is most challenging for us as educators is taking the time to systematically reflect. Um, we are busy, as we all know. We're probably busier now than we've ever been. <laughs> um, so this is a really tough ask. Um, and I'm gonna show you in a moment how I dealt with this. But the key is, I think, to plan that in ahead of time. And I'm gonna show you what it looked like for me, but you can create your own version of this. Um, and, and it's something that we have done with the, the Mario framework for over five years before its launch. So even though it launched two years ago, there were five years that we had purposeful, systematic reflection throughout those five years, which gave us a lot to, to learn from. Um, and then as a result, you're iterating. You're constantly going back to what you were doing and you're adding new improved things. These are, these are iterate, these are new things that we didn't have in the very beginning that you know really propelled us forward over those five years. Um, the last of those being the actual launch of the Mario framework. Um, but I wanna go back to a moment, what you could do in your context to really improve the learning that's happening by including systematic reflection. And I think there's two ways of doing, or there's two parts. One is the ongoing systematic reflection. What I did in my context was looking at daily reflection, weekly reflection, and monthly reflection, and really chunking that out and then putting it in my calendar, the weekly and monthly times. Um, and all of this went into being able to create the Mario framework but again, if you're doing an action research project, you can be using this as well. Um, the other piece is throughout the school year. And it's, it's again, being very thoughtful about when do I need to be, you know, for example, sharing all the proposed improvements to my students. Every year, every year, I always share what are our changes. This is what the class looked like before, this is what it looks like now, and this is why we've changed things. Even when I have new students, this is really useful because they see that I'm always pushing to iterate, um, improve things, and I'm listening to my students. It's a signal for students to know they're being heard. So if they give feedback throughout that school year, they know I'm going to do something with that. Now, just uh, there, there's so much here, and I know you're probably going, okay, we, we don't have enough time. We don't. This is something that we go into in great detail in the Mario Framework courses. Um, yes, we look at one-to-one -one learning sessions, conferences, the, the approach. We look at social emotional learning, executive function skills, um, but we're also looking at how do I measure learning, right? That is part of what this course is and how do I communicate that change? So that's something we dive into um, because it's been a core um, of our organization from the beginning. And speaking of our organization, I'm gonna hand it over now to Graham and I get to take a little break. Thanks, Phil, thank you. So much to digest there. Um, so MARIO is an acronym um, and the, the letters stand for, first of all, M for measured. And the beauty of this is Obviously, we're measuring our students' progress, uh, not just academic progress, but social emotional progress as well. But we're also measuring our own efficacy as well. Um, and the, the longitudinal study that was done on the Mario framework, as well as measuring student progress uh, by GPA, also looked at uh, teacher self-efficacy as well. And we saw really significant gains uh, from teachers in that important area. Um, the A is ambitious. So these students that we have, and, and many of them have real challenges to learning, we shouldn't feel we have to reduce, the, lower the, the benchmark. We can really still aim high with these kids and they can achieve amazing things. So it's really important that we, we set that bar high, keep it high, and then look to remove those obstacles for learning. Uh, 
as Phil said, we, we have a mountain of research. Honestly, it's quite staggering how much the Mario framework is supported by research. We have a research and development team who are constantly adding to that um, database of research and, and on, a, on, on, on almost a daily basis. So we, we're constantly refreshing that, that data bank that we have. And it feeds right into the process. And we're, because we're a young organization, we're very agile as well. And we can shift and move what we, what we have and what we offer if we find some really robust, new, powerful learning data. Um, Phil talked about innovation as well. You know, it's that combination of research and innovation. If all we did was research, then we'd, we'd still all be living in the caves. Sometimes we've got to poke our nose outside and see what it's like and try something new. And when we do innovate, we base it on, on research. Uh, but we, we think what we have, the, the framework that we have, is a really quite a, a cutting edge process. And the O for Mario is the one-to-one -one learning that Phil talked about in great detail there. Um, we've added a P, it's not marry up, but the, the P is really to emphasize that you can personalize this approach for your students, you can personalize this approach for yourself, and personalize it for your school as well. So it is exactly what it says, it's a framework, it's not a program. Uh, and the framework builds in with your program. Um, just, just one other thing to add, um, as well as my work with Mario, one thing I do is I teach online leadership programs. And at the very start of those programs, I always ask the same question, just as a sort of an icebreaker. We've got middle leaders, senior leaders, sometimes board members on there, and I'll ask them to introduce themselves and tell me, one thing, one time when they learned something really, really well, and what were the conditions around that? And I keep that data, and it's really interesting. And it's only just sort of dawned on me now uh, the three things that, that shine through that are the most commonly reported are first of all, we wanted to learn. And actually, interestingly, a lot of it is not in the classroom, a lot of it is outside of the classroom. So my example was guitar, learning guitar. Why did I learn it really well? Because I wanted to learn. And that's the co-ownership that Phil talked about before, that student agency, that sort of shared ownership. The second one that comes through is I really trusted my teacher. I was taught guitar by my dad, by my father. And, you know, I, I trusted nobody more than my dad. Um, so that relationship that we build through the Mario framework is a one that leads to that trust. And the third factor is, and it's amazing how many of these sort of senior and middle leaders said it, the best learning I did was when it was one-to-one. -one. And some of them referenced sports coaching. And it wasn't when I was coached as a team, it was when I was coached as an individual. I got better so quickly. Um, so just wanted to share that as well. It just sort of came to my mind as, a, as an overlap with, the, you know, Adults and, and, and children learn the same way often. Thanks, Phil. Yeah, so Phil talked about uh, Max and, and why do we really prioritize that one-to-one -one learning process? And some of the issues that Max had will, will look familiar, I'm sure to you. Um, and these and many more we find can be addressed effectively through a one-to-one -one approach. Thanks, Phil. So it's really all about, I think, reflecting back and projecting forward. And often we, as adults and as, as, as children, we don't have time, we don't give ourselves time to reflect. And we know when, when we learn, learning is about knowledge, skills, dispositions. It's also about understandings and understandings are embedded through reflection. So the Mario framework through these one-to-one -one learning conversations helps our students reflect on and evaluate sit situations and address and correct any misperceptions. And again, those are things that sometimes we run out of time for, we don't uh, allow time for. But it also allows them to project forward and develop uh, effective plans, predict how those plans will go, and then ultimately 
head in the right direction towards this sort of self-direction that is our sort of holy grail of learning, if you like. And the pathway towards independence, it, it actually doesn't look like this because learning isn't about equal steps, the same size, the same rate, the same frequency. Learning is really messy. And sometimes these steps are huge. Sometimes we have peaks, we have troughs, we have dips, and we have plateaus as well. Um, so the pathway would look much more irregular. Um, but the, the thing with Mario, and I'm just going to sort of slot in a little little nugget here we are developing some really exciting software at the moment that will allow us to track this continuum to track this pathway so even though it's irregular and even though it's it's messy we know where our students are and we can track them and we can help nudge them and and uh, persuade them onto that next level So embedded right through the Mario framework are many high impact learning strategies, but particularly these 11. And why these 11? Because again, these are very strongly supported by research, particularly research from John Hattie and Robert Mazzano. Um, so when you do the, the Mario courses, you'll find the, the learning there is steeped in these learning strategies. So what's the outcome? What's the result of all of this? Well, these are what we, we call the Mario skills. These are not particularly Mario skills because the ones we're looking at there are actually social emotional learning skills, self-advocacy, self-management, self-awareness. So what we find throughout the process is that our students grow in each of these and they grow in more academic skills like goal setting, monitoring, reflecting, predicting, planning, evaluating as well. And then ultimately what we see is, is tremendous growth in self-efficacy and self-esteem. And these are all lifelong skills. These are not skills that just endure while our students are at school. These are skills that are gonna be effective in tertiary education, whether they go to university, straight to, to the workplace and actually skills in, in life as well. So. What we find, and, and interestingly, the, uh, the study that we've done, um, we, we tracked some students beyond school and, and we found that when, they, when they'd finished with school and the Mario framework as such, the, the sort of level of performance and, and increase in progress actually continued the same way, which is what we hoped, because these are all sustainable skills. So just some FAQs that, that we, we get uh, on a regular basis. What age is the Mario framework designed for? Well, as you can see from the, the graphic there, um, elementary school, middle school, high school, the courses in fact are differentiated between, uh, there's one course for elementary and then one for middle and high as well. We don't have anything in particular for, for kindergarten kids, um, but actually, you know, we don't have anything for adults either, but all of these skills and all of this learning is perfectly appropriate. Where do these one-to-one -one sessions fit? Well, again, the, the beauty is Phil described these sort of five to seven minute learning conversations are so flexible that they will fit pretty much in any model. Um, and the, the flexibility of the, of the program means that um, whether you, you run a, um, a sort of consultative model where you have a limited number of interactions with your students and time is precious, that's why five to seven minutes of really structured, focused one-to-one -one is really, really powerful when you don't have that, that additional time. Um, if you have a class-based model, then it fits there as well. And um, it, it aligns you know, really well with a, uh, a multi-tiered system of support and, and the RTI um, system as well. So virtual school, many of us have, have been through this. I think probably all of us have been through this and some of us might still be uh, experiencing virtual school. Uh, what was interesting, I, I just talked with Phil before the call about this one. 
was that when we did the, the study, the, the sort of longitudinal study of the impact of the Mario framework, and this is being published uh, and peer reviewed right as we speak, um, what we noticed is there was one semester where our students were on virtual school. And although the data, there wasn't a, a lot of data and there wasn't sufficient in our opinion to actually include it in the study, what we saw is that the progress in virtual school with the one-to-one -one learning conversations was almost identical to the progress that the students made when they were face-to-face -face as well. So although it's not something that we would sort of publish and claim um, as, as robust research, uh, the signs there are still very, very promising. And just a final thing about uh, pricing. Uh, we are very transparent about this. We have, we, we understand, you know, the challenges schools are going through at the moment. Um, and I mean, just as an example, just before I, I started with Mario in the summer, I was a director of a new school in the Middle East. And um, I know through through that experience, some of the difficulties other schools were going through in terms of um, finances. And sometimes, sadly, uh, it's not something we did, but I know a lot of schools sometimes will look to cut professional development rather than cut other things. Um, so we have discounted our courses. So the the um, what we would call the probably the signature Mario course, the um, educator certification, that one is discounted from twelve fifty down to one thousand and fifty US dollars. Um, we can possibly even go lower if we get a, a, a number of people from the same school uh, on the course. Um, another course that we run for people who've done that first course um, and, and are practicing with the Mario framework, we run the Experienced Educator course. So that's a 10-week course. Um, and that one we've discounted to $900. Uh, and we're also right now building a really exciting course for teaching assistants and that one will run from April and that one is again discounted down to four hundred and fifty dollars uh, and that's a roughly about a, a month long um, so we we try to be really transparent with our prices and try and uh, get them down as, as much as we can we're we're not great businessmen Phil and I but we're in it for the love of teaching and learning okay um that's all we have for you, uh, but we're very happy to, to take any questions if you have any. And, and I think one was already asked by Raphael. And the question was, um, it's in the chat, is how was the process to get the leadership team on board with these changes? Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about the, the process at my school, um, then some of the, the participants we've had on the course, and then some things for you to keep in mind at, as you're thinking about this. I was very fortunate um, to have extremely supportive uh, administrators uh, from the onset, and I had conversations with them ahead of time before I trialed. Um, you know, I basically I was like, look, I spent an entire summer researching this. <laughs> Is it okay if I go forward with this? And of course, there was a yes, that sounds great. Um, uh, but I know that's not always going to be the case for everyone. So how do you go about that? Um, in the course itself, um, we have a section um, on communicating the change. And in that, it is looking at, in your context, what's the best way to really communicate this change to all stakeholders, not just administrators, but to your parents and to your students, right? Um, and some participants actually come on the course before they've gotten approval from their administrators. It's happened actually quite a few times. Um, and they use that time to really um, reflect how they're gonna do that most um, effectively. Something we have though that might be of use right off the bat for you is we have some um, documents that kind of explain what it means to be a a uh, Mario educator. One of those is designed for administrators. I'm putting the link into the chat so you should be able to see it now. And you know, this should help in that conversation with administrators 
this is what it means to do what we're doing. Because I think you want to outline what the Mario framework is. Um, also, you have another resource, and that's us. Um, you know, Graham, Graham is a school leader. <laughs> so I think, and he, by the way, um, he did have uh, educators at his school who took this um, course before he was even associated with the Mario framework. And that was part of the impetus for him coming on board was the success at his school. So I'm sure Graham, you'd be happy to, to speak with anyone, right? Absolutely, yeah, and um, yeah. Part of the reason I joined Mario be was because I saw the impact it had on our students, but also on the teacher that did the course as well, who was absolutely transformed, um, and and was so confident. I then signed up another teacher for the course as well, and even though I I left the school in summer to join Mario, um, I actually had a conversation with the 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 person who took over from me just yesterday. Um, and I know that things are going exceptionally well there. But yeah, Phil and I are very happy to talk to, to school leadership about this. And, you know, often school leadership are the ones who sign off on, on the finances of this. So yeah, we're very happy to have those conversations. And, and another link that's going into the chat box right now, um, maybe, um, <laughs> is, is actually scheduling a session with Graham. Um, and I'm going to put his contact rather than me. I have one too, but I think if you're looking to get administrators on board, um, you know, I think scheduling a meeting with him first, and if I can make it, I'll make it too. Um, so hopefully that's helpful. Does anybody else have any questions? Because we have a bit of time, not a ton of time, but, but, uh, we, looks like we have a little over five minutes. Um, any questions? Floor is over. Yes. Can I ask a question? From Fiji. <laughs> Bula from Fiji, can you guys hear me? We can. Clear. We can. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, nice. It was interesting. I came in the last uh, last week and this week. Just a question. As a learning support teacher, um, when do you have your learning support sessions with the students? Like uh, with us, we have a special period where the students who really need help go to that session and they are with the learning support students. Uh, what is your advice, Philip, on what's a good time for the one-to-one -one sessions? Sure. The short answer is it depends on your context. Um, so part of, uh, so, so I, sorry to not give you a direct answer and I, I will give you a more direct one in a moment, but one of the things about the courses that's special, I think, is your, you actually have one-to-one -one conversation time with your instructor in the course. So that allows you to work out some of these honestly complicated situations that deserve, um, you know, to understand the nuances and the subtleties of your context and have that conversation with your instructor so you can work out what is best in my context. Now, Typically, what would we recommend? Again, it depends. And a lot of that also depends on what stage and what division we're at. Because in the elementary school, what we've seen some participants do, a lot of them, is actually it's more of a station approach. Because at that age too, they're not as much, the confidentiality piece is not the same. For them, they're more comfortable when they're much younger to be able to share information and someone else is in the room, that's okay. And it also allows you to, to work with some students that maybe aren't identified, but you're wondering, right? And you're able to have these conversations. In a middle school and a high school situation, you are wanting to have more confidentiality in place. Um, is that in a class where you have a tier three class or a tier two class, um, or is it a consultative model? If possible, I would recommend the more one-to-one -one time, the better. So I would say in those contexts, it's fantastic if you have a tier three class or a short-term tier two intervention or class. That would be my recommendation. However, all schools do not have the same schedules and flexibility is gonna be different. So in some schools, the consultative model where that's happening before class, before school, after school, that's just gonna to have to be the reality. Um, but I think what could happen is if you see the value and we're really finding this consultative um, model, how powerful this is, but it would be even more powerful 
in, in a class or in a um, <clears throat> more, there's even more time for an intervention that gives you um, more of a case for adding that in your school context as well. Um, but again, the, the thing I would say is we would wanna understand your context better and that's something why we have this course so that we can figure out what is the, the best path to go. I hope that helps below. Yes, thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, we've got time for I think another couple uh, questions potentially. Right, if no one has a question, can I? <laughs> <laughs> so you're going to have to be quick on the questions. Uh, okay, no, okay, like, sorry. Well, uh, this is for everyone else. Bula, you're good. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. right. So for the part where on a one and one you plan, the first part of the, the table is you plan your lesson. Eh? You plan your lesson. Can you be more specific on that? Sure, sure. So um, I say sure but uh, it's not gonna happen in four minutes. <laughs> um, the good news is the planning for this is not planning for each and individual one. You're planning for a structure again, that the emphasis to make this sustainable. Look, we, as educators, we need something that makes, our, makes the learning more effective, but also makes our, our lives, I wanna say easier, but it makes it more, possible for us to spend time on what matters most. And that's the time with the students. So there's, there is front loading that happens in the very beginning before you set up these one-to-one -one sessions and conferences. But actually, once you've done that planning, you're good to go for implementing those sessions. Now, before each individual session with a student, you will be looking at previous learning you had with that student. And that'll be on a student by student basis, but that's just informing your conversations. Um, but at the end of the day, it, it is about having these these one to one sessions and conferences ready to go and actioning on that. You're not going to have to plan every day, um, which is good news, I hope. <laughs> All right. I've been a Makalevu from Fiji. OK, thank you so much. Does, and I think we this is Graham signaling. I think we're about out. So if anyone has one last question. Um, they can let us know, and then I think we'll be closing out. Okay. And all right. Oh, well, we got one. Oh, <laughs> fantastic. So glad to hear that, Alan. All <laughs> right. Um, and, and again, we're, we're hoping you join us. If you don't join the big educator certification course, we have a smaller one called Mario Approach. And the Mario approach is just about how to make those one-to-one -one sessions and conferences effective. Um, it, it doesn't deal as much with the, um, the how to measure learning, communicate the change, social emo emotional learning, executive functions, um, and structured study. So that part's not really there, but it does focus on the one-to-one -one sessions and conferences. So let us know if you're interested in that too. Um, it's the weekend and or Friday. Um, for Graham, just so you know, it's three in the morning where he is. <laughs> um, he, he hasn't said that, but I'll just let you guys know. Um, but we're so happy for, for you being here. Thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. And reach out anytime. We are, we are really looking forward to, to working with you all in the future. Thank you so much.